you've already taken this course with me, so you understand how I teach, understand the instruments in this course. Basically, we're going to have homeworks, quizzes, a midterm, and a final exam. We're going to look at more applications of quantum mechanics, and we're going to build swiftly on the concepts that we learned in first class. So there will be an assumption that you're already very familiar and at home with what we learned in the previous course. And I will avoid repetition and I will move on to more advanced concepts. It's a core course for physics majors, but quite an important course anyway because we tell more examples, more applications of what we've learned so far. Uh, the website for this course is again the same as the previous semester, so you will have no problems uh, in browsing uh, the course contents. I will not upload material on LMS. The course textbook remains the same. However, uh, we're going to start off from chapter number 12 of the textbook, Beck's book. However, we uh, soon go over uh, will go far beyond the contents of the textbook. Uh, and uh, the concepts that I will cover are basically from another, another book which is Modern Quantum Mechanics. Let's first write a simple form of the potential energy. The 
potential energy is simply MGH, where H is given, if this is the equilibrium position, then this height is H. And this is an arc. Okay. So the length of this arc is going to be L theta. And this H is going to be L 1 minus cosine theta. This length is L, this length is L cosine theta. So this height is going to be L 1 minus cosine theta. Hence the energy of this pendulum, which is an oscillator, is given by momentum squared divided by 2m plus m g l 1 minus cosine theta. This is the energy of a pendulum. Now if this theta is really small, we can make certain approximations. If theta remains small, in other words, if the pendulum undergoes small oscillations, small angular oscillations, then the solutions are easy to find. This represents a linear system, otherwise it represents a non-linear system. So if I would like to make a trigonometric uh, substitution which I replace is 1 cosine theta by cosine squared theta over 2, I can write the energy as p square over 2m plus m g l cosine square over into or sine square theta sorry sorry sine square theta right now if theta is really small this sine theta over can be replaced by theta so in the limit of small oscillations energy of this pen will become p square over 2m plus 2m g l theta square over 4 theta square over 4 becomes this becomes 1 half all right now this arc length x let's call this arc length x x equals L theta. So I can write theta as x over L. So if I make the substitution here, the energy in the small angle approximation becomes P square over 2 M plus M G. Theta square becomes x square over L square. So this is the energy of this pendulum in the small angle approximation. Now what you notice here is the following. You have an x here which is a position coordinate and this momentum P in the small angle approximation, it's a linear momentum is given by m into velocity which is mx dot. So you have a position coordinate here that is being squared and you have a derivative of the position which is being squared. So this energy is quadratic in this variable x and the energy is quadratic in the p variable. Now this is a classical system. But we also know that in quantum mechanics, the position and momentum become quantum variables, they become continuous variables and associated with these variables there are operators. There is a position operator and there is a momentum operator. And there is also an operator associated with the energy that is called the Hamiltonian. So what we basically have here is a general form of a harmonic oscillator. I can write this energy as P square over 2M plus 1 over M G M G over L X squared. Now this G over L 
has dimensions of omega square. It has dimensions of the square of the angular frequency. You know from a pendulum that omega is equal to omega square equals g over l. So this quantity here has dimensions of angular frequency square. So I can write the energy as p square over 2m plus half m omega square x square. Alright. Now this m omega square, if instead of a pendulum I were talking about a mass attached to the spring, m, and this spring extends to a distance x, the spring is dilated, then I will also know that the spring constant k is the spring constant associated with this spring. And this omega square equals g over n. So this is the physical relationship between the spring constant, the mass and the angular frequency for a mass attached to a spring. Is it totally analogous relationship for the pendulum? So both the pendulum as well as the spring mass system represent the same mathematical system. It's the same mathematical framework. If I have some surface and to this surface I attach a molecule. For example, this could be a cell membrane and I have a protein molecule here. And this protein molecule is attached to a polymeric chain to the surface, to the cell. This is the cell. This is the protein molecule. Then this system also represents a harmonic oscillator because there is some effective spring that binds the protein, that tells the protein to the cell. So this system also represents a harmonic oscillator. So all of these physically disparate systems can all be modeled to it. And this term, m omega square, is also equal to k. This is an effective spring constant for this pendulum. So this omega square can also be replaced by k. Are you familiar with the potential energy for half k x squared for mass dash to spring? <coughs> In any case, this is the energy of a classical oscillator. Now if we move to the quantum domain, and we would like to find out the energy of a system. We would define an operator because the energy is an observer. The operator is called the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is simply, it transpires from this form. This P becomes a momentum operator squared 2m plus half m omega squared. This omega represents the natural frequency of the system. This uh, system will have a natural frequency with which it will resonate. That natural frequency depends upon the spring constant and the mass. This pendulum will have a natural frequency depending upon the length of the pendulum and the acceleration into gravity. So this represents a physical parameter of the system, the natural frequency squared. And I have an operator associated with the position which is x hat squared. So this is the Hamiltonian for a harmonic oscillator. This is the kinetic energy term, whereas this is the potential energy term that I can also write as Vx or Vx hat. You have a kinetic energy term and a potential energy term. Now you can, if you know the potential energy, which is a function of x, it does not depend upon time. So it's a time independent potential energy function. You can write down the Schrodinger equation and find out what the solutions are. The solution will correspond to the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. So let's look at this harmonic oscillator and let's try to find out what the eigenstates and the eigenvalues are. Okay? However, Now here this potential energy function has a square
square dependence on the operator or if you take this to be the potential energy it depends quadratically with x so if I would like to plot versus x the potential energy is going to look like parabola is proportional x squared However, this, not many physical systems, it's very hard to come up with a, an ideal physical system that has this ideal potential energy function. Suppose you have two atoms that come close to, close to one another and upon a certain distance of approach called the equilibrium which is the bond length a bond is formed between these atoms. Now if you plot the potential energy versus the distance between these atoms, it's not going to look like this nice parabola. Rather, it will have a form that goes like this. atoms are really far apart, the potential energy is zero, the atoms are not talking to one another, they are totally distinct, there is no interaction between them. But as you bring the atoms close together, the potential energy goes down, because the atoms would like to stick together. Suppose these are two nitrogen atoms, they would like to stick together and form a molecule. So the potential energy goes down, <coughs> however if you try to bring the atoms really close together and compress them beyond the bond length, beyond the equilibrium bond length, they would try to repel one another. They don't like this people. So the potential energy shoots up. So this equilibrium bond length, this is the bond length, R bond. It's the bond length in a, in a nitrogen molecule. Now this potential energy function does not look like in any, in, by any means, like this parabola. However, if this is the minimum at R0, we can approximate this minimum by a parabola. So if the atom remains close to this equilibrium bond length, the potential energy can be approximated by parabola. This pink curve and this yellow curve overlap. They are congruent in the vicinity of this bond length. So if you place this nitrogen molecule at a temperature above zero Kelvin, of course the bond is going to vibrate. There is going to be temperature dependent harmonic oscillations. And these oscillations give you a spectrum. They give you a vibrational spectrum for, for the nitrogen. That's how you detect nitrogen. So no bond is going to remain static. It's going to oscillate. So if these oscillations are small, then we can assume that this nitrogen atom is in a harmonic potential. Okay. So if you look at the potential energy function, Vx, and you can expand this potential energy function about the minimum, you can write this Vx equals Vx0, the potential energy at the minimum, plus the derivative of the potential energy at the minimum into x minus x naught plus the second derivative of the potential energy at the minimum into x minus x naught squared over 2 factorial plus the third derivative of the potential energy at the minimum x minus x naught 3 factorial plus higher order terms. This is a Taylor series expansion of the potential energy about the minimum. Alright. Now, what is this second term in this Taylor series expansion? Zero. zero. Because this is a minimum. So the first derivative must go to zero. So this is zero. And if this is really small, 
because you close to x naught, so this term is small, the q power, the third power can be neglected. So the potential energy is equal to Vx naught, the potential energy at the minimum, plus half some effective spring constant or m omega squared, right, which equals the second derivative at x naught into x minus x naught squared plus of course some higher order terms. So this is just an offset to the potential energy. So this potential energy curve can be offset by any amount of that. It can go up, it can go down. That doesn't actually change your eigenscales. It just shifts. It's just an offset. You can always put this equal to zero. <coughs> there is a spring constant term. This is your harmonic term, which represents that this atom, what any system we're talking about, is in a harmonic is a harmonic oscillator. And then there are higher order terms that lead to inharmonic effects, which are difficult to analyze, but they're really important in most. Now, how do we solve the Schrodinger equation with this Hamiltonian? We already know that the Schrodinger equation is given by the Hamiltonian quantum state iota h bar d by dt quantum This is the time dependent Schrodinger equation. And if you want to talk about the time independent Schrodinger equation, it's given by p square over 2m plus Dx. Still we're talking about one dimensional problems into the wave function. In position representation, this is the Schrodinger equation in energy. <coughs> now finding out the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian, which are the energy eigenstates, really means that we have to solve the Schrodinger equation. Now, the solution to the Schrodinger equation in this position representation will be covered in today's recitation. Dr. Adam Zaman will teach the recitations. However, I would like to introduce a new approach of finding the eigenstates and eigenvalues of a certain Hamiltonian, which does not require the use of writing down the Schrodinger equation in the position representation. And the approach that I am going to follow is called the operator method. Components of the angular momentum operators. 
So you define these operators. And you also define the commutator of these operators with, with j square or the jz. And what you ended up was you would find out the angular momentum operators, uh, the eigenstates of the angular momentum squared, j square and j. J square and j. They were labeled as j and j. So these are combined eigenstates of j square with eigenvalues j, j plus 1, h bar squared, as well as jz. Right? So you found out the eigenstates. J, the eigenstates were labeled as J and J, and they had eigenvalues given by these terms. And you also notice that this J could only be an integer divided by 2. There are certain constraints on J. And you also notice that there are certain constraints on NJ. And it is bound from the bottom as well as from the top. So this NJ could only be between minus J and plus j in steps of 1. So this was a purely operator based approach in which you define these raising and lowering operators and the only piece of information you had was the computation relationship between the angular momentum operators. Now here if you notice that this operator depends upon the square of certain components. Here this Hamiltonian also depends upon the square of an operator and the square of another operator. Here you have a commutation relationship between the components of the operators. Do you have a commutation relationship between this operator and this operator? Yes, you do. It's x p is I don't have h bar. So again you have a commutation relationship. We have all the ingredients that are required for an operator based solution. This is the defining, the golden moment that defines how we attack this problem. The two conjugate variables are the position and the momentum and they appear as squares in the Hamiltonian. Okay. So we have to define some raising and lowering operators. So let's define an operator A, small a, as x plus iota over m omega p in m omega over 2 h bar. Let's define this operator. Now, here we define an operator as jx plus iota j by Here I am defining it as, it as x plus iota into the momentum operator divided by some m omega. Why do I need to do that? Because in this case, this angular momentum operator and this angular momentum operator have the same dimensions. However, here position and momentum don't have the same dimensions. So in order to make the dimensions of this this term equal to this term and to divide by m omega. You can find out the dimensions of momentum, divide by the dimensions of mass and m and angular frequency you get the dimension of position. Okay? And this is a is a factor that comes out as a global phase factor, as a global factor because of certain normalization conditions that I would like to achieve. I'll tell you about this. Okay. So I define a raising operator. This is called a raising operator. And if I talk about photons or electromagnetic fields, it's also sorry, this is called a lowering operator. Lowering operator. This is a lowering operator. 
and if I talk about photons, then generally this is called the annihilation of The second operator that I can define is of course a the Hermitian conjugate of A. Same prefactor m omega over 2 h bar x now with a minus sign this is called a raising operator or a creation operator if you, if you were to talk about photons why do we call this a lowering operator and why do we call this a raising or a creation operator that will become clear in the discussion okay. now certain properties of these operators we derive in detail the properties of these the lowering and raising operators. So we have to spend some time on discussing the properties of these operators. First of all, is this operator Hermitian? No, it's not. If I change this plus to minus, it leads to a new operator, which is this operator. The raising and lowering operators are not Hermitian. Neither are these operators. Not have issue. All right. The second property is that I can always find the commutator of these operators. Okay. Commutator of these operators. Now, based upon the fact that I know the commutator between the position and the momentum, I can quite easily find out this commutator. This commutator equals 1. Okay. This is something for you to do on your own. Alright. At least it's clear. Let me show you how. You just take this A. Take this A this form m omega over 2 h bar you multiply it with a dagger so the square root goes away I have x plus iota over m omega t being multiplied or acting upon x minus i t over m omega minus x dagger minus i t m omega x plus i p over m omega. Now I can solve this out. Okay. When I solve this out, the result will just be one. Okay, if I use that uncertainty relationship. That is the uncertainty relationship, isn't it? Because it tells you that these uh, observables are incomplete. Now, the advantage of having this pre-factor is that this commutator turns out to be a simple one. Otherwise, it will have some, some part of m omega over h bar. So, the, this pre-factor is only added so that this commutator takes this simple form 1. This is just the identity operator if you come to look at it. Okay? This 1 means the identity operator. It's an operator itself which is just identity. The other uh, property that I have is that I can invert these relationships. I can invert these relationships which means that I can express this position operator in terms of these two operators. And I can express this momentum operator in terms of these two operators.
to h bar x, right? Which means that this operator, x operator, can be expressed in terms of the basic numeric operators. And it can be expressed in the following fashion a plus a dagger to h bar n omega 1 over 2 which means that operator x equals h bar over 2 m omega a plus a dagger Likewise, the momentum operator P can also be expressed as a difference between A and A dagger. Minus iota H bar over Now, if I have that Hamiltonian, I would like to express this Hamiltonian in terms of the creation and lowering of it. Okay. So, I will need to know the form of, okay, what am I, am I going to do? Expressing Hamiltonian for a harmonic oscillator in terms of A and A dagger. This is something I would like to do now. But first of all, I would need to know what is P squared. Now P squared is simply this operator being multiplied with the operator itself. So I would get minus m omega h bar over 2 a minus a dagger acting on a minus a. This becomes minus m omega h bar over 2 a square minus a a dagger minus a dagger a plus a dagger square. Minus a dagger a plus 
It depends upon h bar omega, which is just an energy. Omega is the natural frequency of the system into an operator, which is the number operator a dagger a plus half. Always, if I just write half, it means there is an identity operator here. Generally, it's not written. So I give you a couple of minutes to go through this derivation and see if this sinks into you. Now what we need to do next is we need to find the eigenstates or the eigenkets and eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. But that also means that we need to find these eigenstates and eigenkets for the number of them. Because that's what the Hamiltonian really is. And that will also reveal to you why we call this number operator. Now suppose we represent the eigenket of the number operator by small n, ket n. Now with this means that the number operator acting on this state gives you, since this is an eigenstate, it returns the same state back, back again, with a certain eigenvalue. Let's call this eigenvalue small n. So this is our eigenvalue equation. N must be real. Okay? It must be real. And it must be non-zero. It could be zero or it could be four. And this is something that you can test on your own. Alright. Now we need to find out. Remember that this is just a label. This is a label for the eigenket of the number operator and this is some number, some non-zero number, which is the eigenvalue of the number operator. Now we need to find out uh, the eigenkets and we need to find out what these eigenvalues correspond to. Now first of all what we would like to do is we would like to find out the commutator of the number operator and the lowering operator. This commutator is simply a dagger a commutator with a. This is a dagger a a minus a a dagger a. Right. Now this is simply the commutator of a dagger with a in. Now this is minus 1, so I get a minus 3. So the commutator of the number operator with the lowering operator is minus the lowering operator. Likewise, the commutator of the number operator with the raising operator is a dagger a 
which is the number of operator commutator, commutator with a dagger. This is a dagger, a a dagger minus a dagger, a dagger, a. Now this is a dagger multiplied by the commutator of a with a dagger, a with a dagger. But this is one, so I have plus a dagger. So these, these are certain rules. Remember, we found out the commutator when we talk about the angular momentum of j plus with j z and j minus with j z. There is something we doing it because this will simplify our calculations later. Now, if this is the eigenstate of the number of operators, let's find out what is the action of the raising operator a dagger on the number state. Now, this state, which is an eigenstate of the number operator, is also called a number state. A number state, right? For reasons that will become apparent. Okay? It's also called a Fock state. Fock state. Now what we would like to find out is the action of A dagger on the number on the number state. That is, we would like to find out. What happens when you apply a dagger on the numbers? What do we get? This is something we would like to find out. So let's G. So what question is the law? So the law is that you use a dagger and a dagger can be termed to be common and it's for common. A dagger on the number. This is something you would like to find out. This will give you some state, some new state. So you would like to find out the properties of that state. How do you find out the properties? Let's. So this is a state, a new state. You would like to, whose properties you would like to find out. So let the number operator act on this new state. Right? Let the new state act. उसके लिए हम क्या करते हैं कि इस नई स्टेट जो बनी है इसके ऊपर नंबर ऑपरेट है। Since these brackets are really permeable, the operators can move around. We can this actually becomes n a letter acting on n. Let's find this out. Now use this relationship. This is simply n a dagger minus a dagger n. This equals a dagger. Right? Now I would like to write n a dagger in terms of a dagger plus a dagger n. So this term becomes a dagger n. Plus a dagger n. So how do you get that over there? So n a dagger. N a dagger is defined as n a dagger minus a dagger. This is a dagger. So n a dagger becomes a dagger plus a dagger n. Okay. Now let's move on. This means that the number operator n acting on a dagger. 
the number state equals I can take A dagger as common h bar omega 
into the eigenvalues of n, with, which, are re, which are represented by n, small n, right, plus half. Now this is, this small n is a non-zero number. It could be 0, it could be 1, 2, 3 and so on. And it's an integer. So it will start from 0. It will start from 0 and it's an integer. And we'll prove why it's an integer. But you can remember for the time being that this small n is 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on. So the energies become quantized. The lowest energy or the ground state energy is half h bar omega. It's not zero. So this is called the zero point energy. The minimum energy of a harmonic oscillator cannot be zero. So if you have a pendulum, no pendulum can be at rest. This is what quantum mechanics tells you. It must have a minimum energy of h bar omega divided by two. That's the zero point energy, also called the vacuum energy. So these are the energy values. The energy values become context. And corresponding to these energy values, there are these eigen gets, get n. And these are labeled as get n's are labeled as get 0, get 1, get 2, get 3 and so on. So the energy of ket 0, which is the ground state of the harmonic oscillator, is half h bar omega. This is the first excited state, the second excited state, and so on. So if I were to draw the harmonic oscillator and its energy levels, this is the energy axis. This is zero of the energy axis. The minimum energy is half h bar omega. And if this state is populated, then the system is said to be in state at zero. In the lowest ground, in the lowest box state, in the ground state. The next state is going to have an energy 3 by 2 h bar. This is get 1. This is get and so on. And in a harmonic oscillator, these energy levels are equally spaced and the separation between these levels is h bar omega. So the harmonic oscillator gives you equally spaced energy levels. The last thing, uh, the last couple of minutes I would like to spend on finding out these coefficients. Now we assume that these coefficients are found out in such a way that these number states that we've written here they are normalized. Okay. So if I look at this uh, equation and I find the Hermitian conjugate of this equation, I would get bra n, the Hermitian conjugate of a diagonal is a. Right. This is c plus complex conjugate into bra n plus 1. So I take the inner product of this equation with its dual. A dagger is really the 
number operator plus 1. Okay, so this is the number operator plus 1. Okay, so it's trivial to find out that the left hand side becomes n, the number operator n plus n n this equals c plus k. Now the number operator acts on its eigenstate to give you small n. So this is small n plus 1 is c plus m mod square. So I can write c plus as under root n plus 1. Now what this means is that this number, if all the states are to be normalized, this is n plus 1 under root. You repeat the same procedure, take the dual of this, this c minus turns out to be under root n. Hence the final result is that if you have a number state, the creation operator or the raising operator acts on it, you get n plus 1 as under root n, get n plus 1. And if the lower end operator acts on a number state, you get n n at n minus 1. We have found out the coefficient c plus and c minus. The set of 8 number. If I have the lowest energy state at 0, the raising operator acts on it. I get get 1. I generate a new state. Get 1. And the number here is under root 1. 0 plus 1, 1. Three. If I raise the state get 1. Of course I get get 2. And here I get under root get. If I raise the state get 2, I get under root 3, get 3, and so on. Which means that I can generate any get n by repeating the action of the raising operator on the ground state. So I start off with the ground state, I apply the raising operator n times, I will get get n, but there will be certain coefficient here. I take this coefficient to the other side, this coefficient is n factorial under root. Get, in this way I am repeating, you catch two ki jaga aap ye da de, get one ki jaga ye da de, so this is the formula that you can write. So I can generate any number state starting from the vacuum state or the ground state and the repeated application of the raising operator. So if I start out with this state, this state is populated, the system is in the ground state. If the raising operator acts on this state, I get this state. Then the raising operator acts on this state, I get this state. So the raising operator is held to climb the ladder up. Likewise, the lowering operator is let to descend this harmonic oscillator ladder. Eventually, if you are in the ground state, get zero, and you apply the lowering operator, A, the state will be annihilated. You will get no more. So the number n is lower bound on the bottom side, but it's not bound on the upper side. The angular momentum of, uh, the value of mj, which is the azimuthal magnetic quantum number, is bound both from the top and from the bottom by minus j and plus j. But here the number n is bound only on the lower side. 